All right, everybody, good evening and welcome to episode 38 of the On Air Advocate. We're at the On Air Advocate. We look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn and I'm the host and producer of the On Air Advocate. And I'm super excited you are here with us this evening or if you are catching this on the replay. As some of you may know, we are in a complete series about chronic pain and pain management, and we have been going through all different layers and aspects of it. So tonight, I am super excited to have with us Dr. Barry. He is an internal medicine physician, a fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Internists, an internal medicine program director. I told you I was going to try to do my best. <laughs> Best-selling author, speaker consultant, founder of drpierreblog.com, and the host of Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. So welcome. First, thank you for having me. I'm just excited. Again, I apologize. I've been, I've been trying to share that bio, but every time uh, I take something off, like some, somebody throws another title on me. There you go. But well, I got through all of them. So I am excited because tonight we're going to take this to a different aspect, which in the last two and a half weeks we have not talked a lot about yet, um, which is really looking at the opiate crisis and how, I mean, the opioid crisis and how is that has changed you in the workplace, in the hospital mm -hmm. setting. I think, uh, and, and it really starts when I was a resident. Okay. Um, training to become an attending. Uh, I'm, I reside in uh, South Florida, I actually train in uh, West Palm Hospital. And what happened in Florida is that uh, in the late 2010 to 2013, uh, they passed sweeping laws uh, to really crack down on what we consider, uh, for those who may know more layman terms, pill mills. Okay. And, and I hate to, I hate to almost describe it this way, mm -hmm. but uh, imagine, you know, going to a doctor's office, you know, paying them a, a lot of cash and then going around, uh, you know, the back room mm -hmm. and then, you know, someone behind the table, it, you know, didn't have to be a pharmacist. It was just someone who was next to a jar of opioid medication, pain medication, muscle relaxers, you name it. And they just kind of like handed like, all right, you want 20, here's 20 and give me, you know, X amount per pill. Right. And this was rampant in Florida to the point where, the opioid crisis, like it definitely, didn't, it definitely did not get the fanfare it gets now, but it started bubbling up back then. That the state of Florida said, "All right, we have to shut this down," and they did it almost. It almost felt overnight. And I remember as a as a medical resident training, and uh, noticing like like right when it happened, all of a sudden I was doing way more admissions for uh, drug withdrawals. Um, drug overdoses. Like I just saw way more patients who were overdosing and much worse withdrawing from medications because remember these patients, they used to be able to have a place to get all of their medications and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden that's taken away from them. So now that, that, that controlled prescription fix isn't there anymore. Right, right. And did you find that in the hospital setting more programs and stuff were developed to you know, crack down anything? Was there more teaching to the doctors? You know, was there I, more programs you guys had to go to to learn more aspects about it? I, I initially, especially in the beginning of my, uh, you know, early career, you know, I'm kind of, I'm still kind of young. Uh, in the, <laughs> the beginning, um, it was more of, hey, this is what you need to do to kind of recognize it. Because so many of us weren't used to dealing with patients who were withdrawing from all of these medications. So we didn't even recognize them. A lot of times they came in with very vague complaints, whether it be abdominal discomfort, abdominal pain, sweating, just these complaints that, you know, sounded like a zebra and had you ordering a million tests here and doing a million things over mm -hmm. there, only to find out that this person was actually just withdrawn from a, a strong opiate medication that they had been taking for years. So a lot of our training in the beginning was really focused on like, hey, this is what it looks like if they were drawing. Hey, this is what it looks like if they're overdosing and really kind of hitting home that factor. Okay. And do you think do you think that it makes it hard for physicians today to um kind of make the discrepancy whether the patient actually truly needs the medication or whether they have some type of a possible addiction or um 
would be the other word for it. Just like it, like more of there's developing a need for it. Yeah, more. Yeah, more of a, a dependence. Are they? A dependence, are they? That's what I was right, are, are, are they becoming dependent on this medication, right. or are they really in pain, discomfort, and they really need it? Um, the, the best examples that I see, even I'm a, as a program director, you know, I take care of uh, in our supervised residents. Okay. And I have residents who a patient may be coming from surgery or a patient may be suffering a crisis from sickle cell disease, you know, uh, issues that really require good pain management. And even them, they're like, I don't know, does this person really need this medication right here to treat their pain, right? So we've almost we almost become distrustful, not only of the system, but distrustful of our patient. So we're not even right. sure, like, like, is this pain true, right? And that's a question we never really had to ask before. Right. And I think the more that people are on medications, though, doesn't that all really become foggy? Anyways, it, it, even the pay for the patient, I mean, as well as to whether it's actual pain or it's the fogginess of not being able to say, this is more of an ache, this is in a different area, this is actually severe pain from this. It, it, it's, it's definitely clouded our, our judgment in, in both fronts, right? Let's, let's, let's put our eyes, you know, we're a patient, right? Because we're all patients. Um, and I, I always tell my residents now, remember, we're all patients, right? Remember, if you treat yourself like you're the patient, uh, then you'll have more empathy for your, your care. These are patients who, you know, four or five uh, years before were able to get a significant amount of pain medications for rightfully uh, diagnosis. Maybe they had an accident. Maybe they had some type of surgery and, and there's some long-term pain control care. Unfortunately, when the pain mills were what the pain mills were, those uh, the t- way we treated that pain uh, was all wrong. Okay. So it's not like those patients went away. We those pain those patients still need pain control. Right. So now, when, so now when they're coming to the hospital, now when they're coming to your office, uh, if you're you know saying you know this person lingering or this person can't use this much medication. Uh, you're doing a disservice for your patient. So as a as a physician, we had to learn, like, you know what? It is okay to treat pain. And, you know, even though we, we hear the stories, because, again, usually the stories are sensationalized, we hear how significant the stories are. We hear how the significant people are dealing with uh, opioids and pain medications and muscle relaxers and everything and above. Uh, but we still have to recognize that that pain is there. On the flip side, as a patient, Understanding that, you know, if you, you know, if you stub your toe, you don't necessarily need Percocet. Right. right. Like that's, it's, it's an, it's an education that really kind of goes both ways, right? We, we've have to, we've had to educate uh, the practitioners to say, hey, this is how we treat pain. This is how we recognize pain and go about treating it correctly. And as a patient, as the consumer, which we are, Mm-hmm. This is how we deal with the pain, right? Because I think we have a very, fa- unfortunately, especially in, ha- in medicine, right? And my mm-hmm. physician colleagues would tell you all the time, pa- some patients have a very fast food mentality when it comes to being taken care of. Mm-hmm. So if they're aching in pain right now, they need a medication that removes all pain. Like if it doesn't remove all pain, then there's something wrong with that medication. And, and that school of thought is sometimes you have to re-educate your patient on. Right. Like you're looking not for the pain scale to go from a 10 to a 1. You're looking at from go to a 10 to a 5 is progress or a 10 to a 4 is progress and letting that be okay. Yeah, you're 100% correct. And I think and you hit it right on the head. I think a lot of people really want to get it to that 1. And for most people, it's not going to get to the 1. And they have to understand you'll probably never get to the 1. Mm-hmm. You just have to be comfortable with the 5. Right. And as the physician, how do you monitor after your patients go on those types of medications? You know, from my perspective of having a child that has significant special needs and being in a pain clinic before, you know, because we've done tons of pain management and whatnot over time, the follow up on youth um, or children under the age of 18 is pretty stringent in the sense of follow up, checking in, all of that. For adults, I feel like it's just as hard, especially if you're an adult that lives on your own. You get a bottle of pills, you're in pain, you go home, you start taking them. Every time you have pain, you take another one, and then it all kind of becomes a little foggy. What monitoring system is put on it for adults, or at least in your area? I know for 
for adults, especially for our prescribers, um, one of the things we do, and you know, I've, I've been to plenty of courses that kind of talk about prescribing pain control, is we say, hey, you know what? If a person has this type of disorder, you should be able to give them this amount of pain medication and it should last for this long, right? Because the duration of time is a, a, a key factor for us, right? Because again, if I give you a medication that should have lasted you for two weeks or should have lasted you for a month, but mm -hmm. two weeks into the month, you're already back and seeing one, you know, my pain's not controlled, two, uh, my prescription is out, you got, that's when we have to start being careful, right? Because it's, because it, it's a two-part thing, right? Did I not correctly uh, treat your pain initially? And did I, did I lowball your pain? And that's why after two weeks, you're back in my office? Or right. am I having to be concerned that what I thought uh, was enough pain medications for uh, a person, you know, dealing with, you know, an ankle sprain or something in that, in that ilk, uh, wasn't enough for you because you're used to it. And, and I think dependence is something that we don't talk about a lot, especially uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, when we talk about, you know, patients who are overdosing on, you know, heroin and all these other stronger opioid medications, uh, the concern and the reason is, is that your body is very good. Your body is a well oiled machine. You may be able to take uh, one prescription of one pill of Percocet and it may cause you to be groggy and fatigued and tired. You're like, oh, like, cause I remember, I remember I was a, I was an undergrad and I had to get my wisdom teeth taken out. And the dentist prescribed me some Percocet cause when you get all four wisdom teeth taken out, mm -hmm. it hurts. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking one of those Percocets and feeling so groggy and tired and drool. And I was like, I was like, whoa, how could I do this? Uh, but your body, you know, yeah, and it, like if, if let's say if the pain was so great where I said, you know what, I got to take another one, eventually your body gets used to that one pill. And that first dose response that I got uh, mm -hmm. doesn't happen. So all of a sudden, to get the same pain relief, I need two medications. I mean, I need two pills to get the same right. that the one pill used to do. And all of a sudden, I need three pills right. to get what the one used to do. And then you just kind of gradually stepwise climb. And that's, that's what happens for your patients who are dependent, where mm -hmm. I gave you a month supply, or at least I thought, but your body's so like, oh, I, I do this all day. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to finish this in two weeks. So you, your, your attendance have to go up. You say, okay, um, either you didn't tell me that you're used to taking this medication, or I have to be worried about abuse. Right. If, you, right. if you're used to that medication, then that's me under treating you, and I can adjust that. But if, if you say, oh, I've never taken this medication before, but two weeks later, all of a sudden it's gone, mm -hmm. my antennas go up. And, and I'm, I'm not sure about Wisconsin, but in Florida, we have uh, a prescription, a control prescription, uh, a system called E-Force that uh, allows me to look up a patient by name and date of birth, and I can tell who I could tell you who wrote a control prescription for you and where you filled it at and how you paid for it, whether it be cash, insurance, yeah. uh, anywhere in the state of Florida. And I think now, I think we, we it's added the state of Alabama last time I checked. So okay. and, and we've had to do that because fortunately Florida, um, I'm, I'm not sure how it is up here, but Florida is pretty bad. Right. You were saying in maybe in the top five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 you don't want to be in the top five for cor correct like you know if we're talking about sunny beaches please vacation mm -hmm. please come to sun sunny florida yeah. unfortunately when we're talking about opioids and the opioid crisis unfortunately florida is on top of that as well mm -hmm. and i think we were speaking before we hopped on a little bit about how a lot of people come to south florida or to florida in general to do their rehab like they may have had other issues you know, and then they come down there just because, because of leniency or just because there's those facilities that, these rehab facilities that might be a little shady. What do you think? Um, I, I would say that it's a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've had the transition, right, where our, our business practices went from having a pill mill in the early 2000s and then the, the government cracking down in that. Mm -hmm. And now, because of the opioid crisis and 
how now insurance is involved and insurance is willing to pay and insurance is willing to take care of patients dealing with opioid crisis, you know, someone, you know, much smarter than me is saying, hey, if I open up uh, a rehab center, I can get this much money from the insurance. So what they're doing, they're opening up, you know, multiple rehab centers here in, you know, greatest, you know, sunny South Florida. I'm, I'm in South Florida, so great, but it's, in, it's all across Florida. And they're, they're advertising up your way. They're saying, hey, if you want to get off that medication, come to my rehab. And, you know, you don't want to be in this area where you're trying to get off the medication. Come down to Florida away from, you know, your bad influences. Unfortunately, these patients don't know there's a lot of bad influences waiting for them. Right. Not to say, not to say that all of them are, right. are bad, right? I'm not saying that, but there's enough uh, bad ones for you to have to be very cautious when when you're sending a loved one to Florida for rehab. Like, you really have to do your homework. Right, to make sure they're going to a legitimate place. They're there. And I know last week we were talking with our pharmacist um, in Georgia, and we were talking a little bit about the layers and her kind of policing. Like after the doctor writes the prescription, then she gets the prescription, and then it shows up in her system, and then it tells her in her system some of those same things you were talking about, like if they've had it before, where they filled it. And she said one of the key things is, is doctors that write prescriptions that are outside of their area. So if somebody brings her a script, and the doctor that wrote the script is three hours away or 150 miles away, what are the odds that you really drove to her pharmacy from 150 miles to get that filled, um, mm -hmm. where they kind of have that last layer where they have to kind of be the policing of it as to whether or not after you guys write it that, you know, they fill it. And she said that's just been put her job over the last decade in a very different aspect. You know, there's a lot of that and a lot of um, patients that are upset a lot of times with her. <laughs> you know, because she has to be the gatekeeper sometimes to be like, I'm not filling it. Um, she oh, yes. that, can be, that can be extremely difficult. Um, so have you found as being a physician that you guys have gotten a little bit more creative with really approaches with um, your patients to make sure that you give them other modalities and other resources aside from, you know, just pain medication for, you know, when they are in pain? Yeah, I think it's it's really driven home uh, the aspect of like what other ways can we do to treat some of the common uh, you know pain modalities that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I know at our hospital, Wellington Regional Medical Center, um, we're actually working on uh, as an osteopathic physician, uh, we specialize uh, you know out, out, other than our you know allopathic MD uh, okay. counterpart physicians in osteopathic manipulation. So our hospital is actually working on bringing a program where if you're registering, you know, on a scale of one to 10, a certain pain level, um, mm -hmm. instead of us giving you, you know, that Percocet, we're going to do some manipulation treatments on you while you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're doing it because we're trying to find so many different ways to really like uh, be that stop gap as far as like, wow, this patient really is on a lot of medications. Um, mm -hmm. And especially with your pharmacist friend, like, I mean, I, I can tell you when we, when we talked about the pill mills, right, it's not as if the physicians were alone, right? You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people were getting paper prescriptions and going to your local pharmacy. Right, your, not corporate pharmacies. Right, your, your pharmacy was just, here you go, here you go, take it, here you go, take it. So our pharmacists, and it's really been a team effort, uh, you know, with government, with physicians, with pharmacists on really cracking down on like who should be taking this medication, how much medication should they be taking, how long are they taking these medications. Uh, best example, I have pharmacists, in fact, today, today I had a pharmacist, I, I had a patient, he, he had surgery, he was going home, I sent his prescriptions to the pharmacy because he needed pain medications, and she called me, she was said, hey, you know, I was just confirming that, uh, you know, you only wanted to send them with this because it was a, I, cause I'm, I'm, I'm a low, I'm, I always like to low ball my patients sometimes, especially if I know they need to go see their doctor. Cause that's a trick too. And in a hospital setting, you almost have to give them less pills than you normally would to force them to follow up with that surgery. Oh or, yeah. When they're done. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, cause they won't do it. If you give them enough, they won't do it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so the pharmacist called me. She said, hey, you know, I just wanted to know, I, I saw you gave this bunch of medication. Is this just for like a short time uh, frame? And what was the diagnosis? And so they, they want to know as well, too, because they don't want to be responsible because, again, uh, you know, if a person overdoses, you know, what? They're, they're not just going to just stop at the physician. Uh, they're going to go all the way to where that person picked up that prescription from and said, hey, if you look at this patient's chart, they picked up a prescription here. They picked up a prescription here. They picked it up on this day. They picked them up this day. Didn't you catch that? Like, so like everyone. It's like, it's like such a team effort now. Mm -hmm. so, and, so you, <laughs> oh, go on. Go on. Oh, no, so, so, so you, I think you have to, uh, you know, initiate a lot of different ways to treat pain. And a lot of it is just the education. I just got to educate my patient like, hey, you're not in that much pain. You don't need that much pain medication. Uh, get a massage, get some warming towels, get, do some osteopathic manipulation, like do something different mm -hmm. to really try to like uh, delete me, deviate from having to take that pain medication. And again, and it's not like we don't want to treat your pain, right? And I, I think that's something I always stress to my patient. Uh, I want to treat your pain, but I don't want your pain to be uh, the overbearing thing that takes over you. Right. And it will, because it'll get to a point where the pain just becomes mental and right. they're not necessarily hurting in the sense of the pain is active. They're hurting in the sense that their brain has sent that signal that says, hey, I haven't had a pain medication in a while. Give me another one. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, do you guys have a new protocol for like all of the different aspects that you look at with someone's, um, you know, body when they come in, you know, like you're looking, I've heard that over the last two and a half weeks, I've talked to all different from chiropractors to different doctors and whatnot. And they've kind of like, it's more looking at the whole person. Um, or would you say that that's done more by like their primary and then you'd be more of like a specialty that they would see. So you wouldn't be doing all of those things with them. Uh, what what happens, especially being in the because as a, as a I call, I call myself the primary in the hospital as an internist, um, uh, I'm the one who essentially has to you know direct them you know make sure they get to where they get to when they leave the hospital, whether it be okay. going to a rehab center, whether it be going to a skilled nursing facility, whether it be just going home. Um, mm -hmm. I have to be one to make that judgment to say like especially because most of most of my uh, subspecialists. Uh, love for us to write the medications, right? You know, because and, and I think we kind of talked about that how um, physicians aren't writing pain medications anymore. Like this, they right. become so hands off that the fear of being a person who wrote that prescription on a patient who may overdose later is so great that they just stop writing it. Um, and you know, right. they're funneling everything to the pain management doctor as if. There's some rule that says only a pain management doctor can write for Percocet or, you know, MS. Right. Like it is, but it's like, especially in South Florida, I, I don't know how it is um, uh, up north, but like in South Florida, like I, I used to have uh, physicians like, oh, you write for them? Like, uh, yeah, why well, wouldn't I? Like, my patient needs it. Like, I'm going to write for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's definitely uh, been something that as a physician in the hospital setting, I'm having to do the assessment, say, all right. Uh, you're you're in for this medical problem. I know usually with this medical problem, the pain should only last for this long. And if the if I know the pain should only last for this long and a type of pain, this is the right pain medication. So, and you we have to do that reflexively now. There, there's not even like a, I wish this. Now I think about it, it should be a course, right? And there's not even like a course that says like, hey, look at this diagnosis, treat it this way. It's more of you're kind of filling out, or you're kind of seeing what's what worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past, and you're just kind of going from there. Because again, especially when you talk about dependence, you can have you know a big bulky person, and you give them one of Percocet, and they're out, they're out like a light, and they're saying, "Oh my God, what did you, what'd you do to me?" And then you can have a frail, small person, and they're like, "This is candy. Like I need three. Like so, it's right. so we you always have to remember that." Um, the the prescription and the prescription strength, uh, once your body gets used to it from a chemical adaption, right, those numbers are like out out the door. Like I tell my residents all the time, because we, especially in South Florida, we take care of a lot of patients with sickle cell disease. And these are a lot of chronic pain patients. Uh, just because the disease is a chronic disease that causes a lot of pain. 
And, you know, sometimes they're afraid to give them pain medication because they're like, oh my God, this person's so small. I don't want to. And I'm like, yeah. just give them to them. I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they, they can do that and not even like flinch. And usually that is the case. So it is a really a case by case basis where you're just kind of uh, hoping. And again, you're hoping with your best medical judgment that with the right diagnosis, um, the, the normal time frame that it should, that you're giving and you're doing the right care for your patient. Cause that's what it is. Remember where we're, we talk about the opioids, we talk about the pain crisis, but remember you're, you're trying to take care of your patient. The patient's hurting. Right. In in the best ways that the best and safest ways that you can and making patients understand that, that you're not trying to stop them from taking something. You just want them to think about it. I think it's such a good thing for them to remember what you said. You know, your body does become used to the medications that you're taking and they become irrelevant. Like they don't work anymore. You know, the same, um, except obviously taking huge amounts of that, you know, can take your life you know? Mm -hmm. And so just being so cognizant of that, I think sometimes when we have pain, it's like, we just want something and we just want it to instantaneously take it away. And that's all we're thinking about. Um, but I mean, history has shown now to all of us, we need to be smarter and wiser. Yep. About it. Like we know, we know the answers now. Um, now I know from the long list of things that I read off that you do multiple other things that people can <laughs> reach out to you. They can hear content from you. And so tell me a little bit about, I mean, you're on this podcast, but I want to know a little bit about your podcast and what you go through um, with your audience. So uh, the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry, it's a podcast I started last year. Mm -hmm. And it really was, uh, I call it like a spinoff, uh, because I used to do Facebook Lives uh, okay. on a weekly basis, and I would just talk about different medical disorders, but I would really try to break it down in a way that, you know, everyone can understand. Because mm -hmm. we're, we're in a time now where your physician's seeing a lot more patients, you're spending a lot less time with your physician. A lot of times your question that you want to ask, you don't even have the time to ask because your physician's already walking out the door. Mm -hmm. So what I did when I started, when I started my blog and then eventually got to the live stream videos, I said, you know what? I may not have enough time to talk about diabetes during our appointment, but I'm going to do a, a whole live stream video, 10, 20, 30 minutes, and you can watch that and you can get that understanding and you can watch it anytime you want from the comfort of your home. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening is people love the video so much that they said, hey, we would love to be able to listen to it, you know, while I'm driving, listen to it while I'm taking a shower, listen to it while I'm working out. Um, can you make an audio version? And then we kind of got swept in and did the podcast version. So uh, the podcast is a, a weekly uh, episode where we just talk about different medical issues, um, public health issues. I have a master's in public health as well. And, you know, the opioid crisis is a perfect example of where medicine and public health collide. And it happens a lot more than most people think, but it's definitely an opioid, it's definitely a public health crisis for sure. Um, we, we still do the live stream videos, we're still blogging as well. So it's definitely something that I try to do uh, for my Lunch and Learn community because I know a lot of times they just don't have the time to speak to their physician and right. ask their physician those questions that, you know, that's been kind of bothering. I'm like, you know, what is blood pressure? Like, in fact, this week's episode was on cholesterol because I get a lot of questions on cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to check my cholesterol? Why do I have to take this medication? Why is cholesterol so important? So I just kind of answer that question for them so they can say, okay, that's why doc that's what my doctor wants to do. Because I, I can tell you, I'm, I'm, I can be honest, like my physician colleagues, a lot of them have trouble uh, really explaining, you know, and a, a level that most of your patients can understand right. uh, why they have to do what they have to do. And mm -hmm. your pa and your patient, and I, I always say your patient, it's not like your patient is not compliant. They just don't understand how important it is to take it. Right. So you, right. You, you teach them and you, you get them to understand. They'll love right. you. Cause knowledge is power. And mm -hmm. then we can take control of our health. So I think that is awesome. So I'm going to be tuning in every week oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> now to um to listen the other thing is is that i know that it says here um author wrestling author so is that on the medical realm kind of books or is this on a completely different maybe so yeah no i'm glad i'm glad you asked that i as a 
I, I consider myself a medical mogul, right? My, I have a coach, I have a, and I stress to all people who are trying to do better themselves, right? Get someone who's already done it so they can teach you how to do it much quicker, right? right. Um, so I have a, a business coach, uh, Dr. Dreon Birch, who's actually, who's actually been in the news recently because he won a trademark case versus the rapper, right? But that's all another discussion. Um, but he was my business coach. And when I talked to him, he essentially said, you know what? Uh, Barry, like you got a lot ahead of you, right? Like you got a gift that you need to share with the world, uh, but you can't confine it in the clinic. Like you can't confine it in the eight to five. You can't say, you know what? I'm going to see my patients and go like your, you, your patients in uh, the world needs to see you doing more. And, and that's where I endeavored. And that's where we have the live stream. That's where we have the podcast. That's where we have the book. Uh, the best selling author was on, on Amazon medical moguls. Um, was uh, is an anthology on 21 amazing other medical moguls. And we just kind of give our story and talk about what got us to where we're at today. And we talk about some trials, we talk about some tribulations, uh, because as a physician, I think a lot of people, when they see physician, they see straight A, you know, 4.0. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, there's way more stories of physicians falling down getting up, falling again, and then finally getting up that last time than there is the straight A 4.0 uh, student. Mm -hmm. So that so I was able to uh, become a best-selling offer off that book and kind of following my, the lead from it, um, I started writing uh, what I call affirmations, uh, which are almost like when you think about your New Year's resolution, mm -hmm. it's, I say, you know what, I want to be able to have a podcast. I want to be able to speak um, you know, at uh, places and get paid to speak. I want to be able to have my time freedom. So I said, you know what, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to put it down in the book. So it's not like a New Year's resolution that I keep to myself. Right. So if I don't do it, you know, and no one knows, now the whole world knows what I'm planning on doing. So if I don't do it, someone's going to be like, hey, I thought you said you were going to do the podcast. What happened to it? And so now I, it almost, as, as an, I almost use it as an accountability partner. Because now the whole world's my accountability partner. Because I say, hey, here's my book. I, these are what I want to do for this year. You know, hold me accountable if I right. don't do it. And uh, this year we're actually working on. Uh, I'm actually completing uh, the part two, right? The power and affirmation, right? So, which again is uh, a more affirmation, more goals that I'm planning on for the rest of the year. Uh, because again, I gotta get my accountability partners to keep me in check, make sure I'm doing it. Right. I, I'm one for always writing down your goals, put them right in front of you, put them out there to the world, let them know what you're going to do um, so that they can, so that they can hold you accountable. Now you do also speaking engagements, you do consulting and then your blog, can they find that right on your website or is there a separate or is everything on the website? I've, you know, I've, I've, I've made it and that was one of the things I, I you know, I thank my coach for because before I met him, like the, what I call the blog was like, Ugh, like I like even when I think about it, like oh my god like, yeah I can't believe that's my website like it was a bad one and what I've done I essentially consolidated everything so if you want to go and you want to watch the videos the videos is on drpiersblog.com if you want to watch and if you want to listen to all of the podcast episodes and for some reason you don't have Apple Podcasts or Spotify mm -hmm. or uh, you know iHeartRadio well, all of these podcasts for some reason you say you know what? I only want to listen to it on his website it's there as well. If you want to uh, read some of the blogs that we've done, uh, it's all on there as well. Okay. So it definitely, I've, I've definitely made it so that you can just go to drpiersblog.com and then just kind of find your way, whichever way. And then okay. Just <laughs> whichever avenue, whichever mm -hmm. avenue you want to go. Um, and we will definitely drop that below in the comments afterwards and in the comments above <laughs> so it will be um it will be in both spots there so i love it so tonight we kind of broke down a little bit about uh the crisis as well as a little bit of motivational affirmation so that doesn't always happen and so i love that <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It was like a great combination. Um, so with that, is there anything that you would like to leave us with, you know, in the health perspective or the affirmation, you know, I, realm? I, I think one of, one of my, my, my goals, especially in, 
uh, when when we do these things, like when we do the on care advocate, right? When we do Dr. Pierre's blog.com, when we do a lunch and learn, right? Uh, the the goal is to empower, right? And so our, our my motto, right, is to empower yourself for better health, right? Like I want uh, my goal if I can if I can just do one thing is that I empower you to want to take control of your your health and want to be healthier mm -hmm. and want to get off your medications, want to lose weight, and want to do all those things you want to do, but you've had these roadblocks that you weren't just able to get over. Like I want to help be that stepping stone to help you get over it. That is great. So they need to head on over to check out your your blog.com page that has everything there. Yes. So they can yes. start to do that. So they can start yes. to do that. <laughs> and, and and everyone join the list serve. Um, I like to do uh, I like to do free gifts. I've I've actually just gave away um, a, a book of a recent podcast guest of mine. Um, for this, for high, you know, potential learners who, high strong folks who, you know, just need to relax a little bit. Um, it's a great book by Dr. Nicole Washington. Uh, it's just, so I, we just, we just gave two of those books away uh, in our private group. So join uh, the group at drpiersblog.com slash join, and then you'll be able to get right into the group, sign up to the listserv, and uh, we'll take care of you. Um, that's great. And, you know, lastly, I think that anybody who's listening that doesn't live in Florida, you definitely have such a wide scope that if they happen to that private group, you'll be able to answer. Most definitely. And I think, and, and that's really been the goal. I think what's, what's been happening, right, especially from a medicine standpoint, mm -hmm. is that it's, it's two things, right? Our, our physicians are getting frustrated because the physicians want to spend more time with their patients too. But because bureaucracy and paperwork and administrative stuff, they can't. And f f the patients are now becoming frustrated because they don't have time to talk to their doctor no more. So they're having to rely on uh, what we call Dr. Google, right? They're having to rely on a lot of outside sources, which may not be trusted. Right, like WebMD, don't go yeah. there. I, 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 always tell my, I always tell my patients, <laughs> If you go to WebMD, please don't go if you have a headache because it's going to tell you you have brain cancer and you're going to ask me uh, why I'm not doing a million dollar test to rule out you have brain cancer, right? So please don't do that. Um, it's, it's one of those things, uh, and uh, I, I was actually thinking about, you know, you would do the book on that, where the doctor-patient relationship kind of changed, where patients want to know more. Mm -hmm. In the old time, you know, I just tell a patient, jump, they ask how high. Now your patients really want to know what's going on. And I think that's where Dr. Pierre's blog come in because, you know, it kind of feeds them that information from a trusted source and not from someone who's just, you know, writing to write. Right, right. And so it doesn't matter what state you live in. It's all awesome content that you're going to learn from. So for everybody for this, I don't even know, we're on Tuesday. Empower yourself. <laughs> for, for better health. Empower <laughs> yourself for better health. I thank you so much, Dr. Barry, for being with us this evening. And um, hope to have you back again sometime. And so. <laughs> and anytime. Thank, thank you for, again, I, I think what you're doing is admirable and is actually amazing uh, because you're really putting it out there because, you know, this is what people need. And sometimes people don't know what they need until you give it to them. Right. And so, so, so what's, so, cause I was, cause you know, my, my wife, you know, my wife's a big fan of yours. So she's like, no, you gotta be on the show. I'm like, all right, all right, sure, sure, sure. Like, let me, let me find something to talk. I, to, I was scared. I was like, oh, am I going to be able to, can I fit in? And I just wanted to be able to fit in because uh, your message, I know is going to resonate and it, it's, it's touching so many people that especially in the, and I know you, you kind of talked about it in your intro, the, the audio world, the video world where we may not be able to touch everybody right we may right. not be able to physically see mm -hmm. who all you know who all's lives were changing but like stop stop doing what you're doing for a week and see if you don't get an email saying hey what, what happened mm -hmm. I thought you were, like like and and that's when you know you're doing what you're supposed to do so keep it yes. i would love to be again anytime again you know i'm, I'm an internist uh you know which is essentially an adult doctor so anytime you want to mm -hmm talk oh, about yeah. we'll no, no kids no kids no kids yes <laughs>
<laughs> yes, I love to bounce off questions all the time, and I know that the, my audience does as well. So I thank you so much, and I know it's even later by you than it is here. It's almost 10 o'clock. It's almost 9 o'clock here. So with that, everybody have a fabulous rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in to the On Air Advocate. If you want to find any of our podcasts, YouTube, tutorial videos, any of those things, just head on over to onairadvocate.com. Also make sure that you are part of our private community that will be launching June 1st. It's the On Air Advocate community. You can find it right on the Facebook page and we're going to be having all different, everybody's going to be in there from the doctors to the pharmacists to the caregivers. So everybody's going to be there to throw around questions and I'm really excited about it. So thanks again, Dr. Barry. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. And join, join the group. I'm going to be in that group. Um, I will answer medical questions, of course, with the caveat that oh, you, should, yes. you know, you should, you know, defer to your primary physician, but I'm, I'm glad to help because that's really, that's really the goal. We're here to help you. Yes. And in the group, we have lots of disclaimers because we're all there giving our, our thoughts, our opinions, and what may have worked for us. And what may have worked for us may not work for the next person. And that's why this is so awesome because it is all ideas for us to try them out, see if they work to have a healthier life and healthier living. Mm -hmm. All right. So on that note, thanks again. Talk to you Thank soon. You. Thank you.